welcome back to another episode of the Executive Compensation Podcast. Today, I am excited to have uh, Jim Heim and Tom McNeil on the show. We're going to be talking about tailoring pay to the situation. We're going to break that down into pay mix items, incentive metrics items, and implications of deviating from proxy advisor preferred practices. So really excited to dive into these. Uh, Jim and Tom, can you quickly introduce uh, yourself to both to everyone in the audience? Yeah, sure. I'll go first, Tom. Uh, Jim Heim. I am a Boston-based consultant with Meridian Compensation Partners. have been doing this work for uh, over two decades now, and my sort of sweet spot in terms of uh, clients served includes uh, technology companies and life science companies, um, and absolutely a lot of companies on uh, IPO ramps. Uh, Looking forward to the uh, discussion. Thank you, Jim. And I'm Tom McNeil. I'm a partner with Meridian Compensation Partners based in the Woodlands, Texas, just north of Houston. Uh, Like Jim, I've been doing this for more than two decades. Uh, While I focus uh, probably mostly in the energy space, uh, I do assist clients in a broad range of industries, uh, including telecommunications, financial services, uh, consumer services, uh, and utilities. Uh, And likewise, uh, very excited to uh, uh, engage in today's discussion. Great. Well, let's dive in on our first question here on uh, for PayMix items. And so media, media articles and proxy advisors and to some extent institutional investor voting policies often assess executive pay using a single template without any regards for industry specific facts and circumstances. Uh, is this a useful framework for understanding executive compensation or should pay be analyzed by industry sector? Yeah, Jake, uh, I'll, I'll start with that. Um, the answer is is not not a simple black and white answer. It's, uh, it's really yes and no. The proxy advisor's perspectives uh, are useful for some uh, as they offer standardized views across a large swath of industries and companies. However, not all industries are the same, which leads to varied applicability and great debate uh, of the proxy advisor observations for, for many industries. Uh, one area that this may be as, as uh, evident as any is in regards to peer group selection, uh, which varies in, in, uh, across industries. Unfortunately, uh, the media perspective often doesn't have any template, uh, at least not a consistent template. And as a result, there's often misinterpretation of compensation practices and quantum. Uh, but I'll leave it there. Yeah, it's really an impossible task, I think, that um, is presented to the poor reporter who each year has to sort of think about what, how do we summarize what's happening in the world of executive pay. Um, the idea here is do we somehow uh, combine these thousands of companies that really have a thousand different stories, a thousand different uh, challenges that they're trying to solve for, and probably have uh, tailored their pay programs accordingly and, and try to parse out common themes. Um, I think the danger often happens when we extrapolate uh, to situations where a particular practice might not work. Yeah, and so what are examples of sectors where the the pay mix should emphasize, let's say, short-term rewards? <laughs> you know, Tom, I'll, I'll take a stab at this one to start, but you might want to dive in. Um, I would suspect that the uh, the sectors that you're going to find a lot of heavy emphasis on short-term bonuses would be uh, financial services, for one, and uh, I won't steal your thunder, Tom, you're more familiar there than I am, but also some uh, consumer discretionary businesses, uh, areas where really having the products out this season that sort of address this season's consumer demands, now that, that's kind of critical to the whole business, and it, there really is a sense of urgency each year in maximizing that year's opportunities. So in those cases, it does sort of make sense to put more dollars into that uh, bonus category, uh, addressing here's the um, what we need to accomplish over the next 12 months. Yeah, Jim, I, I would agree with your, your, your comments. Uh, you know, financial services is, is a good example. And, uh, and, and, and again, different industries do have certain uh, specific needs for uh, a greater focus on short-term incentives. I think another dimension to look at there is uh, the life cycle or the stage in the life cycle, uh, cycle a company is in. Uh, for example, 
a newer uh, company or a company that's in, in more of the development stage of its life cycle uh, is probably more focused and should be more focused on short-term incentives, sort of the day-to-day -day blocking and tackling uh, that's required to get the company stood up and up and running uh, and uh, for which management has greater focus uh, and, and greater control on the outcomes. Uh, ultimately, if they're doing well in those areas, then it will accrete to long-term value, uh, which can be measured as the company matures. And so what are then are some examples of sectors where the pay mix should emphasize equity-based long-term rewards? Uh, basically anyone they work with. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I work with a lot of software companies. I work with a lot of biotechs. And in both cases, there is absolutely a huge appetite to... Um, embrace the idea that the bulk of compensation is going to be in the long-term equity-based uh, category. And I think in general, the idea is it's understood that these are business models that inherently are risky and that where uh, decisions made today might not accrue benefit for years to come, but when they do, things tend to move very quickly. You have a, um, an ecosystem around these companies where all the parties involved um, feel very much aligned with the idea that the ultimate uh, indicator of success is shareholder value created. And so there's a clear appetite to load the executive team up with equity, um, frankly, loading them up with uh, stock options to a greater degree than what we might see in uh, other sectors. Um, sometimes combining that with uh, some decent stock ownership guidelines. Uh, but in general, the idea is we're comfortable with a little bit of discretion in the bonus plan, especially in biotech. Um, but the real idea is to always keep focused on creating value down the road. I, I sometimes summarize this as it's a little bit of a different model than other sectors in the sense of you don't have companies that are playing not to lose. They are playing to win. And because of that, you're taking big risk that might have uh, some negative impact in the short term. And you can stomach the losses in the short term so long as we are progressing towards a, a real value creating uh, opportunity uh, three, five years down the, uh, down the path. That's great. Yeah, I, I, Go ahead, Tom. I would just say, I, I think to Jim's point, I think uh, it, it is important for most companies to have uh, a fairly heavy emphasis on long-term incentives. Um, as we mentioned uh, before in talking about the emphasis on short-term incentives, I, I think that is focused on companies in what you might say are special situations. Um, new companies, um, companies in distress, things of that sort. Once a company is sort of in its uh, uh, is sort of fully uh, hit its run rate, you might say, as a as an operational company. I think long term incentives really need to be the primary emphasis of the incentive plans for the top executives. Uh, that's where you really get uh, the alignment with shareholders over time. Uh, that said, it is important to balance both short and long term uh, and assess whether or assess what that balance is based on facts and circumstances specific to the company. That's great. And so what are some key considerations for selecting incentive metrics for a given industry sector? And can you maybe give some examples of how incentive design and metrics can differ across industries? Yeah, I'll take the first crack at that. Um, it, you know, when assessing metrics, it's really important that the metrics are reflective of the short-term and long-term value drivers uh, for a company, and that they align with and support the company's business strategy. Uh, there should be a relationship between the metrics uh, and uh, used in the long-term and short-term plans. Uh, for example, short-term incentive metrics, there should generally be a greater focus on key financial, operational, and other metrics that are value drivers for the company and for which man management has greater ability to control in the near term. Long-term incentive metrics, on the other hand, should focus on the long-term value creation and alignment with shareholders. Yeah. Let me talk a little bit about um, 
kind of a, an, an, an oddity relative to some other sectors. Um, if you think about a, a pre-revenue biotech, so a company that is uh, yet to bring a, a drug to market, um, these companies in general, it's not as if you're going to measure them on revenue. They have no revenue. Um, you're not going to measure them necessarily on uh, income statement measures. What they do have, though, is the idea that we do have to have discipline about managing cash. So there's almost always going to be within their short-term incentive uh, scorecard, if you will, a category that speaks to cash management. Uh, the other things that are important is they've got to progress their, uh, their, their uh, possible treatments through their pipeline. So you might uh, see uh, items that are related to uh, progression to clinical trials. Um, they also have to, th these are true startups. They are building the organization as they go. So you'll often see uh, an additional measures that, that, that really sort of speak to that, growing the organization, instilling the culture that we want to operate under for years to come. Now, when you get to the end of the year, it's not necessarily a case where each of these goals has hard, fast targets that we are working towards. It's more of a case of uh, the year-end bonus discussion is a discussion between the board and management. And it's sort of a look back perspective on were there opportunities we missed? Um, are there lessons learned going forward? Um, but then it's largely a discretionary assessment for how much of that bonus do we pay out? Because it's discretionary, it's also understood we're not putting as many dollars behind this element of compensation as uh, some other sectors might. Um, this is a useful tool, a useful mechanism for keeping us honest, for keeping us progressing, but it's not the end-all be-all of uh, what we're trying to achieve. And um, therefore, we're putting more uh, emphasis on the, um, the long-term incentives, on the stock options and uh, similar equity vehicles. That uh, makes sense. And yeah, what I'm hearing here is, again, all these companies have these different situations, different industries, pre-revenue, everything like this. Um, is there any other kind of particular maybe examples of industries or special situations you can think of that would be um, good examples to look at here? Well, I've, <clears throat> I've got a, an interesting situation, uh, client situation. It's a uh, mortgage reinsurance uh, company, uh, which due to a, a variety of, of, of events in its history, uh, is in a, a runoff situation, meaning their objective is to manage the portfolio uh, uh, of, of, of the company, the balance sheet, uh, down uh, in a negative way, basically shrink the size of the company and do so in a, an efficient and effective way. That doesn't fit into the typical model of growth and profitability uh, in the company, at least not in the near term. And so uh, there, Number one, we're not using traditional income statement and balance sheet metrics. Uh, there are some very specific and unique metrics to this business. Uh, and second of all, and maybe most notably, is that oftentimes it's mitigating the negative, mi mitigating the downside. And that doesn't fit well within um, uh, a lot of the external perspectives that, that, uh, that, that, that we often see. Uh, so that provides some unique challenges for this particular company. That's great. Um, so another question I would have then is, you know, why would a company use a performance measurement period that is less than three years for its long-term incentives? Uh, any thoughts there? Oh, oh, I'm happy to uh, step up to, uh, to that one. Um, so as context, the, um, some of the drivers in executive uh, pay design, or maybe not drivers, but at least commentators that get a lot of attention, are proxy advisors, uh, organizations that um, advise uh, uh, shareholders on how they might want to vote on various uh, ballot items. One of those ballot items is, say, on pay. Um, over time, proxy advisors have endorsed certain models, and there's a little-known secret in executive pay, which is the magic number is always three. Um, oddly enough, there's a, a sense that if we have a vesting period, a performance period that's more than three years, it is truly long term. If we have a performance period that's less than three years, suddenly it is not long term. There's, there's magic to it. Well, a struggle that a lot of uh, cloud software companies have, for example, is they're not all that comfortable with the idea of setting multi-year income statement goals. Um, 
in all honesty, it's often the case that a, a three-year revenue goal or a three-year EBITDA the goal, it's really a three-year guess. Anything might happen in the next uh, few quarters that could make those goals, in retrospect, look either ridiculously uh, ambitious or l like layups, uh, neither of which are great situations for a uh, compensation design. And consequently, if you look at a, a list of cloud software companies and you, know, you grab 20 at random, you will find all sorts of creative manners of kind of addressing that fundamental challenge. Um, you will see companies that have instead one year performance measure goals, and then they'll layer on some additional service based time before you can actually earn the awards. But you earn the number of shares based on this next year's performance. You'll have companies that do that model, and then they layer on a uh, what's called a relative total shareholder return plan, which is basically, we start off by seeing how we did against goals, but then we're going to spend three years seeing how our stock price does relative to a basket of uh, similar companies, and that might uh, bump up or bump down the number of shares ultimately earned. Um, you'll have companies that have parallel one-year, two-year, three-year performance periods. There's a, there's a lot of creativity. In each of these situations, though, one of the things that's common is there might be a little bit of a pushback from the proxy advisors initially, um, just along the lines of, does this really feel like long-term performance that's being assessed? And so it's incumbent on these companies in these situations to really put some effort into the, uh, the storytelling and uh, having crisp explanations to their investors about why they chose the model they did how it's uh, in the shareholder's interest, how it holds management accountable. Um, really, in an ideal world, there's also an opportunity to sort of show how it has worked over time. Um, and if it's not working over time, you know, that's the opportunity to pivot to a different model. Um, I think uh, continuous improvement is a, uh, a theme that probably resonates with a lot of these companies as well. Uh, as the company grows, as it evolves, a new type of program might make sense for compensation. Um, it's great. That makes a lot of sense. And you definitely see how, you know, an individual company or companies that have so much uncertainty over the next three years, like you said, particularly in tech, it just makes a lot of sense there on why it would be really hard to set a three-year target for an industry that it just moves at such a rapid, rapid pace, um, especially if they're, Absolutely. you know, recently gone to IPO or they're still kind of growing and everything. So much happens in that space so quickly. Okay. Uh, so. Another point on this I want to hit on as well is the prevalence of um, stock options. You guys have mentioned has declined for several re reasons. Um, and are stock options still viable for long-term incentives? Um, and, you know, what sectors do they fit or not fit in? Yeah, I might take the first crack at that. Uh, you, you know, stock options historically were uh, much more prevalent than they are today. And there are a number of factors that really uh, specifically – uh, influenced uh, the downward trend in, in the use of, of options. Uh, one was an, a change in the accounting rules a number of years ago. And then uh, in addition to that, it was uh, a greater emphasis on dilution and overhang uh, from share plans. Uh, as a result, the number of uh, companies that use options and the weightings of options in the, in the long-term incentive mix has gone down significantly. Um, replaced in large part by performance shares. Uh, I personally think that stock options uh, have a very important role for many companies, um, especially ones where uh, there is uh, a great deal of volatility in the industry for companies where there is uh, a, a long cycle from investment to returns um, and in the case of, and Jim can speak to this in greater detail, in the case of technology companies and startup companies, uh, they are a highly competitive and highly attractive mechanism uh, for uh, attracting and retaining talent. Yeah, and I, you know, I'll actually pivot. They, um, they very much remain the coin of the realm for recently IPO'd uh, biotech companies. Um, they still are a very, very popular instrument, at least at the executive level, for a lot of uh, software companies. There are a few common themes for how to make these things work well. And one is setting clear expectations up front 
that these are vehicles that foster alignment with shareholders over the long term. Over a short period of time, um, because of the stock price volatility and because of when you receive your options, you can absolutely run into situations where you have what look like uh, pretty stark inequities between someone who maybe got a grant in March versus someone who got a grant in July. Um, year over year, those tend to smooth out. But if you start setting the expectation that this is an award where when things are going south, the company is in a position to uh, reset, if you will, uh, then you have a problem. That is, um, that is uh, I think, uh, an item that uh, shareholders are not particularly uh, thrilled about. And it's, it sort of gets to the whole uh, concept of uh, underwater option uh, repricing or underwater option exchanges. Um, but these are a, a vehicle that works wonderfully with a lot of my biotech uh, startups. They are really trying to foster alignment with uh, their investors over the long term. It's really difficult for them to sort of come up with uh, performance measures in their long-term incentives. And it's also, there is something to be said that it's just understood to be the most prevalent uh, instrument in that sector. Um, where a lot of the recipients themselves are very comfortable with the idea of this is a high risk, high reward instrument. Uh, they're always looking at the, uh, the upside potential. That's a very different story than other sectors where you really have to focus on protecting the downside. You're really looking at the equity instrument to uh, perhaps be stronger with respect to providing retention hooks and options are not gonna be providing retention hooks when they are, when they are underwater. That's great. Um, well, let's jump over to another topic here of how are your clients finding a place for ESG in their incentive programs? Are there common ESG metrics that make sense across all sectors? Are these also kind of uh, similar or individually sectors or how do you guys look at that? Yeah, th this is a, a very hot topic and, and uh, getting hotter, I would say. Um, I, th there are clearly commonalities to uh, the, the categories, the pillars, you might say, of ESG across every company in every industry. Uh, however, there are also significant differences. And I think um, one of the things that uh, companies are challenged across different industries is what's the right fit, what's the right metric for their company and their situation. A um, couple of examples. One is uh, within the oil and gas industry, uh, the, the, there has been a significant focus for a very long time on uh, environmental health and safety metrics, um, spills, uh, work for, uh, uh, workplace injuries, things of that nature. Um, in this new realm of ESG, uh, those types of metrics uh, are table stakes. Uh, the new metrics in, in, for ESG in oil and gas is really more about emissions and carbon footprint. Um, the challenge there is how do we measure that? What's the right baseline? Things of that nature. And all companies are figuring that out. I've got another company, uh, another client company uh, that is in a uh, consumer services business where it's not as obvious what the, the environmental uh, component of ESG uh, is. Um, they're much more focused on the S component or the S pillar of ESG. So the point is that it, it, it really varies by company. I think um, what's most important for companies is to have an ESG strategy, uh, disclose what that is, uh, and then figure out what's the right measurement and time period over which to uh, measure in the, the, the ESG metrics and uh, at what point is it appropriate to incorporate them into the incentive plans, including uh, understanding the balance of the cost and the benefit of the different metrics uh, as you in, in include them in the business model. All right, that's great. Well, let's carry on to our um, final area here on just implications of deviating from proxy advisor preferred practices. Um, and so when do companies need to be mindful of proxy advisor perspectives on executive compensation? <clears throat> well, some companies probably need to be more mindful than others. Um, a lot of this really 
depends on what your shareholder base is and the degree to which they are influenced by the proxy advisor vote. Are they subscribers to uh, uh, an ISS or a Glass-Lewis? Um, with, um, especially with a lot of uh, small cap companies, you might often find a shareholder base that is dominated by perhaps one or two investors. There might still be some uh, private equity money in play. Um, often you'll have um, some insiders with a, a significant ownership position. And that tends to insulate you uh, to a degree from uh, criticisms from the proxy advisors. Larger companies that start to have much more of an institutional shareholder base, the story changes. But even then, you don't want to make the blanket assumption that every large institutional shareholder has a similar mindset about pay issues that the principal proxy advisors have. Um, so one is just understanding your shareholder base and do they in fact listen to the proxy advisors. Uh, number two is really the performance story. If you have not been delivering returns for shareholders in recent years, your pay program is going to get greater scrutiny, period. Um, it is much more likely that you'll also end up in a situation where these uh, advisors might suspect that you have a pay, for, a pay for performance misalignment, which increases the likelihood that they are going to recommend against uh, say I'm paying. Um, but the, the commonalities that, that, that you can see there are, one, is the, uh, is, has the investor experience been positive? Two, are the investors um, generally uh, customers of, uh, of these outfits? Um, there's one other danger item that's probably worth mentioning. If the first time your investor, a large investor, ever hears about you on pay matters is when you have a problem, that's, that's not a healthy dynamic. One of the things that's really happened over the last, oh, let's say, eight to nine years is companies have gotten into a much better practice of proactively reaching out to shareholders, having rel rel uh, regular shareholder engagement on compensation issues. That's been a very healthy dynamic, um, and it sort of provides a mechanism for uh, not just communication back and forth, uh, but to sort of move the dials each year because you can sort of see signals about uh, items that your own shareholder base might be uh, concerned about. And if you don't have that ongoing mechanism, you're setting yourself up for um, some bad surprises in the other uh, bad years. Uh, no one ever wants to be approached only when you're asking them for a favor, frankly. Yeah, That's great. I, would, I would agree. I would agree with with Jim's comments there. I think um, it, it it it's it's really important for companies, especially when uh, they they are in different industries that don't always fit into the template that we referred to earlier, the uh, proxy advisor uh, template, you might say, uh, to engage with shareholders uh, through multiple uh, media, uh, both through direct engagement, as well as obviously through the proxy statement disclosures, uh, and really tell the story. Why do we do what we do? Uh, and, and, and really lay that out in a clear and convincing way. Um, and and that, that really addresses a lot of the issues. That's great. And, and so for companies that are outside of these preferred practices of the proxy advisors, um, are there any other ways that they kind of approach gaining, you know, shareholder support? You guys have kind of hit on some of this here, but anything else that comes to mind? Well, I'll reiterate the point uh, of having a crisp uh, explanation. Um, anyone who is uh, in the unfortunate position of having to read a lot of proxies every year is going to recognize that um, as a communications document, they've really changed. Um, there is a certain format that is emerging that's kind of standard and that, frankly, investors are getting used to reading. They, they expect to see certain tables that speak to here's what we do, here's what we don't do. Um, they expect to see tables that uh, speak to uh, what are the benchmarking comparators, the peers, um, often uh, evidence that there's pay for performance alignment. Um, so upping your game with respect to that type of disclosure is important. The other thing to always keep in mind here is, uh, well, nature abhors a vacuum. If you are not telling the story, somebody else will tell it for you. This is absolutely the case with uh, any criticism that might be coming out of proxy advisors. If you have a uh, cDNA section of your proxy 
there's very much a compliance document that's here's just the facts ma'am here's some tables um, but aren't making an effort to share the analysis uh, and to explain why you chose to do what you did believe me your investors are going to look for that type of information from somewhere and it's likely to be coming from ISS and Glass-Lewis and it might be that they have a take that you don't agree with. So making the effort to be proactive on this front is absolutely critical. That's great. And final question here before we wrap up is, um, you know, what are the consequences of failing, say, on pay? What happens then? Well, uh, in that case, you, you're forced to do the shareholder engagement. Um, it's... Um, Look, it's 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 unlike in the UK and in in, uh, in Europe, it's not a uh, a binding vote, uh, but it's still a, sig a significant event to fail say on pay, um, and less than two percent of companies do fail say on pay on an annual basis. So you don't want to be in that very small minority. Uh, but what it means is that you have some 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 follow up action to do. Uh, and need to engage with shareholders uh, and, and listen to them and be responsive to what they are looking for. Now, shareholders might, you know, might say very, might offer very little. Uh, but if you failed, say, on pay, uh, there are enough voices with enough voting power that you're not doing something right. And you need to take heed of that and make changes. And so it's really about uh, listening and then responding, and that's 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 frankly how the proxy advisors also, uh, in large part, assess uh, the next year's say on pay uh, evaluation is how how responsive were you, uh, and again, as we said, uh, articulating your rationale, articulating the shareholder engagement process, what you heard, and how you've responded to it. Um, I would agree with all of that and I would add one of the most significant consequences is just the time sink that you're going to be experiencing trying to get out of this hole. Um, your board member time every five minutes that's spent on uh, addressing um, the fact that uh, we lost the faith of our shareholders on compensation is a minute that's not spent on um, strategic thinking. Um, and Make no mistake, I'm not suggesting these aren't important items. It is absolutely critical that you have uh, shareholder support. Um, what you do on compensation is sort of a lens to the rest of the organization's decision making because there is so much information that you're sharing with investors on this topic. It is absolutely going to be considered a lens to how the company goes about allocating resources and how deliberate it is in its, uh, its approach. Um, but once you, uh, you run into uh, some trouble, you run into some headwinds, you are going to be rolling up your sleeves and trying to get out of that penalty box for a while. And it is absolutely, absolutely a drain on, um, let's just say, mental energy. Great. That's phenomenal. And so as we wrap up here, the final question I'll ask both of you guys is, um, if you, if we kind of have been talking here about a lot of the details about tailoring pay to individual situations, and at a high level, you know, what advice would you give to a company just around this topic of having to tailor pay to individual situations? What advice would you give someone? You know, I would say, I, oh, go, go ahead, John. John. Oh, all right. I was, was going to say, you know, honestly, the hardest part here of the process is articulating what is the problem that you're trying to solve right up front. And taking the time to really think about that, to, to, to sort of identify here's what our performance priorities are. Here's how we want to reward them, our tolerances for missing targets, our expectations for rewarding upside performance, um, how we want to be positioned versus market, taking the time to really argue, articulate what does success look like is, is um, going to inform everything else that happens later. And it's, uh, it's fascinating to me how often... Um, we sort of uh, fast forward through that step and instead just have an appetite to immediately say, okay, tell us what the market studies are. What are other companies doing? Uh, what's, the, what's the general prevalence of practice? What are the trends? 
And what's similar about all of those items, what other companies are doing, is they're, they're not you. They're solving for problems that you may not have. They're solving for uh, different priorities, different uh, constraints, uh, different oppor opportunities. Um, so, you know, I, I very much am a fan of the start out with the blank sheet of paper and try to really work through with the board, with the management team, what does good look like and why? And I would agree. I, I think it's really about focusing the design of your incentive plans, everything from the mix of pay to the metrics uh, to your business and your business strategy. Um, get that out initially and then figure out how it fits into the various templates uh, uh, and lenses through which the outside world will, will evaluate uh, th these programs. Um, it's a lot easier to sort of round the corners or smooth the corners, the rough corners, uh, than, than, than to, uh, uh, start with something that's not really a good fit for your business. Uh, and then second of all is just explain it in very clear and, uh, concise terms, uh, to establish the rationale for it. And frankly, if you can't do that in a, with a straight face, maybe something's wrong with the design. Uh, but I think those are the real the real keys. Right. That's great. Well, thank you both for taking the time to come on here, Jim and Tom. This was phenomenal, and uh, appreciate you guys sharing all this knowledge today. Thank you, Jim. Our pleasure.